Okay, welcome everybody. We're most of the way through now. So you've made it to right up to 80% of the way. And after this, only one more to go. Then you can start practicing and doing exams and all that sort of fun stuff. So we're continuing this week with the operational and the physical security side of information security. And contrary to what people think, it's actually extremely important. So we're going to do all this stuff in the normal everyday manner, uh, looking at uh, what we have in our classes. I'm still my same old self, etc. Uh, me, partridge in a pear tree, etc. So, going over all of the class in the normal ways, I'm sure you know all about this and um, I'm terrible with this uh, sort of bit. Anyway, marketing stuff is up there for you to watch at your own leisure. Uh, now, security principles. Once again, I will say this one again and again and again. Availability, integrity, confidentiality in that order for most businesses, most organizations. The whole reason we connect, why we are here. If we don't have availability, then we're not going to be there. And accuracy of data generally actually matters as well. If we don't have data that is accurate, then, well, again, why are we there? So we are here going through all of this. So let's start with operational security. This is after we have things in place, when we change it from being just that thing that happens every now and again as a project to day after day after day. Many people think that's the boring side of it, patching and maintaining and whatever else, but this is what actually makes us a secure operation. So, you, the candidate, will be expected to identify the resources, hard and soft, that must be protected. By hard, we mean physical assets, equipment, racks, servers, cables, and the soft. The intangibles, which is a misnomer because in reality we can actually put tangible values against our intangibles. So we need to protect assets. We need to put privileges and we need to restrict access to things, allow access at the same time. And what we're looking at is all of the above, information security controls, audits, response, violation, audit trials, resource protection making sure that we have the correct privileges for our operators, recovery procedures, operation or, um, well, let's see, hardware, input, media, changing things out. At the process, I'm, an, I'm um, organizing a whole of little red boxes and other things to come in so that we can have a nice big data center built where we've got petabytes of information. At that level, well, one of the things we'll need to do is switch out hard drives. So just going in, switching these things, putting new ones in, making sure that they're accurate and updated and the integrity is maintained becomes important. Separation of duties and configuration management, many of which we've already covered. This is one of the things you'll start to see. Although there is a lot of information here, different domains cover it in more detail. So one may touch on it, but another will go right into the detail of it. So operation security used to identify all these controls. All right, so what we're trying to do is identify the different controls in place, the things that we can see, what we can read, etc. cetera, um, use, access, day-to-day -day things that we're going to control. And one of the key aspects is audit and monitoring. These tools allow us to identify security events know that it's not just an event but an incident and learn from it all. So we can look at it from a group, individual, process, whatever else point of view and using all this determine, well, what has happened, how effective it is and know that our network is or isn't working to the appropriate level. Now the old way of doing this is OPSEC. So operational security. So this is the military process, looking at adversary intelligence systems, etc. Now there are some of this in business, but the reality when we're looking at a seam or something like that uh, in a business system is going to be very, very different. Oh, now goals, 
We want two areas. We want to maximize confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and minimize the effect of threats, vulnerabilities, and asset losses. So over time, we want things to get better. We're attempting to try and improve the scenario. We're, we're attempting to, well, basically ensure that we have availability. We're attempting, well, let's see, to ensure that nothing changes. We're attempting to look at the um, confidentiality of our data and ensure at the end of the day that we're not losing out. That the threats that we face, well, they're as small as possible. Any vulnerabilities, we can never get rid of them all. We don't know them all. But what we have has the minimal impact that we can have. Any asset losses are small. So we're looking at reducing any loss to the smallest that we can reduce it to. So what are we looking at? We're looking at how we do this on a day-to-day -day basis. The job requirements and specifications for a start. Background checking. So what, uh, I've got a question here at the same time. What third-party tools, uh, sources are available when most of my event situations cannot be answered by my, opera, uh, my OS provider? Um, ooh, let's see. That's a hard question. I might have to take that one offline into the forum, Darren. Uh, there are many, many tools and whatever else. Uh, and I know your situation um, quite well, but uh, there's so many different ways. So if we can move that one back to the forum, that's a nice little discussion area. But anyway, operation management. What we're trying to do, terminate people well, hire people well, make sure that we have the right people, the right culture, and everything else. Because if we get it wrong, this is our biggest, biggest threat. If we don't have this done correctly, then this is where, well, we start leaking information. At the end of the day, making sure that we control our people is going to really, really set what we're doing over time. So it allows us to create a trusted computer base where we're starting with. Uh, what's the best vulnerability assessment tool? Depends on what you're doing. There's no one best. It's going to depend on your network. This is the difficulty here. So there are things like Nesis, OpenVAS, and then there are core networks. But if you're looking for vulnerabilities in code, then maybe AppUnix or something like this. Because what are you looking at? So are you externally scanning or are you trying to create good code in the first place that you're, you're looking at? So again, let's put that one on the forum. So we, we want to make sure that we're checking for backups of critical information. If we don't have a good backup process, that's a vulnerability. If something goes wrong, we lose hard drives, whatever else. And it's not one we can just scan with um, something like Nesis. So at the end of the day, we might think about the best vulnerability tool, but what is the actual question? What is the vulnerability we're seeking to address? So, CEH, uh, where you, you're pointing it there, that's a very small answer. When we're talking about what is the best tool, well, there is no best tool. It depends on the question. We need to define the question correctly in the first place. So all of these things can have vulnerabilities. Need to know, least privilege, etc. And none of these are going to be scanned as a pen test. Your operational aspects of your business, how you have uh, implemented, well, controls over employees, are not something that you're going to generally test in a penetration test or with something like Nmap. That's just which ports are open. So um, there are some aspects of what Darren's talking about that the CEH does cover, but. Um, uh, again, it's uh, some bits work, some bits don't. Anyway, privacy protection, PII, we've covered some of the legal requirements and other things. We also need to make sure we have record retention in place. Now, this is an area I've published on before. Many people don't understand the legal requirements of keeping documents. That varies. It may be five years, it may be seven, it may be 20, it may be 70 plus depending on what we're doing, there are documents 
that needs to be, need to be recorded for a long, long time. So we have to make sure that when we do it, we correct how they're being maintained, marking, um, destruction levels, everything like this. So to do this, we have to think about the different control categories we have on the organization, the directive and deterrent controls, preventative controls, detective controls, corrective and privileged entity controls. So all of these go together to create what we actually are. So preventative controls, remember, we put things in place to try and minimize what's actually occurring. But at the end of the day, our preventative controls will never, ever, ever, ever protect us completely. Preventative controls help. They minimize the start of loss, but that's it. They don't do everything. So detective controls. These find out through audit and monitoring what has gone wrong. This is over time, for instance. This is as we're going across all the different systems and things. Then we're going to start looking at where have problems occurred? How do I find them? And this is where we're looking at monitoring and other things. Next, once we do find something, we need to actually correct it. It's no good sitting there going, hey, we have a problem. Well, what do we do with it? We want to actually try and minimize the loss. After something goes wrong, we start working on it to minimize the loss. We can look at privileged entity controls, so access and how we control that. We also have application controls in our software, transaction controls, whether we're looking at input, output, change, etc., and test controls, making sure that we actually test all our information and data correctly. Now, when we're talking about resource protection, it's everything. It's not just a website. We are not here just about a website. To actually have an organization, we need to think about the entirety, the whole. Communications, how we get in and out boundary-wise, processing equipment, any password files, SAM databases, for instance, application libraries and source code. Not protecting this has been a big problem with some clients have gone out to, where Someone has gone, they've left, the hard drive's failed, whatever else, and they haven't been able to get their own source code because they haven't maintained it correctly. Software, operating system from um, Microsoft, Linux, whatever else, the system utilities you run, any vendor software, directory tables, proprietary information, you name it, it's all required. And over time, we're going to have to protect all of these things. The backup files need to be protected. The telephone network, that thing we still have here, although I'm you know, personally only on mobile and Skype these days. I try and pretend not to have a phone line. Then all these things need to be maintained and controlled. And we do that using a variety of our operational controls. We have privilege protection looking at what people can and can't do, is one of the main ones. Media controls, who can get access to these things. Administrative controls, again, nothing we can test with standard penetration tests and things like this. How, how do we look at least privilege? How do we look at separation of duties? So trusted recovery process as well, where we're looking at system boot, system emergency restart, system cold start. We also, we've covered this one as well. Different levels of RAID, level 0 to level 10. You need to know all of these different terms. So when we're looking at double parity, interlock parity, all this sort of stuff, and we can do this either by hardware or software. So many ways of doing it, of course. Thinking about email security. Email is that visible area on the network that everyone still uses. I love, love all these things where we, we sit there talking about how email will go away because we've got chat. Well, it won't because email has a different function. The thing people forget is email has a different function to chat, so we're not going to get rid of it anytime soon. Email is like mail. Chat covers other things. Instead of uh, sending quick messages, whatever else you can, uh, the, the old way, we do it in modern ways of chat. Rather than SMS, we chat, etc. So they're different aspects of things. And we need to make sure that we secure it properly. Uh, actually looking at protecting MX records, protecting who can send, who can forward, stopping ourselves being a spam gateway, and 
on top of all of this, ensuring that we have antivirus controls in place. I mean, good thing to do. So, request impact, all of this sort of fun stuff. I know everybody loves change management, don't we? Change management, this fun thing we all love to hate, but it's important. At the end of the day, if we don't do change management right, then we're going to get all sorts of problems put in our network and we're going to lose control of what we've been doing. So, request, impact assessment, approval, build, test, implement, monitor, and it needs to be authorized. Anyone have an idea why we want to have a CCM board, someone to approve our changes? Not talking necessarily about emergency stuff, although we should go through emergency changes after the event and make sure that they're done correctly. Why do you think we have this? What does a CCM board do? So as you're answering that one, I'll keep going. So hardware inventory configuration. What we need to also know is what we own. Having worked for years as a forensic guy, um, I'll tell you one of the things that I've done many times, I've, I've worked out with um, uh, a number of insolvency guys. We've gone out to, um, to buildings and done the you're now bankrupt um, seizing assets bit <coughs> and I've been in there to capture things and we've gone to machines and found out that they're not actually correct. They have the wrong hard drives, they have the wrong memory, staff have gone and decided to change things a little bit, that sort of stuff, so lots of fun. So we also need to manage risk. So yes, as people have been saying, we want a holistic view of all changes. We need to be able to manage that um, effectively and have ownership over the risk. We need to integrate. Now, just changing a patch level or something like this is something that we need to ensure is done correctly for the simple fact that there is more than just, well, implement the patch and hope for the best. How does it work on different hardware? How does it work with different versions, etc.? And on top of that, we need to make sure that, um, as Angela said, separation of duties is ensured. The person implementing the change shouldn't be the person who signs off on the change. We need to know why. And it's all, as Graham has said, um, has said about business impact. We're trying to maintain as little problem and as maximum uptime and all the rest as possible. So we want to make sure that we maintain a working system over time. So other things, library maintenance. This is one that um, used to be very common back in the old days, back when I started with um, old Sunos 4 machines and um, um, DEC machines, showing my, um, my age here. Yes, exercise helps keep you look a bit younger. Um, library maintenance was about so back when we were looking at the old IBM machines that we ran with the big tapes that uh, looked really cool in Word and flashed lights at you, then we had library maintenance. All our source code, object code, configuration code, backups and everything was stored. We could then go back to the mainframe concept of a librarian and work out what we have where. Now we do this differently. So. SVN, for instance, if we're uh, one of the products I use is Tortoise. So when we're doing our source code, we have um, uh, a source library, so to speak, so, so we can look at all the different versions as it changes, etc. Patch management, we need to identify patches, do testing, and roll out. So deployment challenges, how we're doing it for mobile, powered systems, rollback, etc. All needs to be put into play. We need to know what patching we have what we're doing, how we're installing it, and we have all the difficulties, of course, especially when we're moving into a more well, BYOD type environment where we have all these different deployment challenges as different people have different things. Now, example of project uh, I'm looking at uh, more managing with uh, one of my companies that I'm involved with. We're looking at um, um, doing key signing and things like this. So we have mobile key pairs that are controlled and distributed and we have those on mobile systems and it seems easy until you realize that well as you change Java you have to update all the keys or as you move from platform to platform you have to then change how you're doing it so the web crypto API that the um, uh, W3 has great 
except it doesn't work on every browser. Wonderful, isn't it? But we can get around most of these issues if we actually do proper testing and ensure that we test the majority of things we're supporting before we roll it out there. So our privileged users, once again, we have root level users in Linux, all those guys who run the Cisco machines, the operator privileges, admin privileges, security administrators, etc. How we go about this matters. So at the end of the day, we're going to have people doing the management of our systems. They get on there, they set the privileges on groups, they set who is a member of these groups, they add and remove accounts. So this is an important concept because if they don't do it correctly, then that person who we're probably paying a pittance uh, could get quite annoyed and whew, too bad, off we go. So we also need to think about um, all the other things like um, vulnerability assessments and ensuring that we maintain this correctly. Just because we have not been doesn't mean that we, well, let them do everything. And this is one of the other things where doing a penetration test may not actually find. So auditing, it's a management tool. Auditing is there for compliance checks, for external things, for internal and external reviews. Um, and we need to think about how often we do it and it's really about providing a standard of due care. Management gets to put a level of governance risk in place so that we can say this is what we're doing and we're meeting our legal requirements and whatever else. So we are meeting what we need to do but we are actually managing and running our company correctly. We know what we have in place, we know what we're doing, that's what it's all about. So auditing ensures that we're doing things well, at least if we do auditing well, but many people get their auditing really, really badly screwed up. Unfortunately, it's not the way that it always works. So audit trails, accountability, reconstruction of events, knowing what's happened, being able to tell what has occurred, and this means security events, whether it's an incident, um, and then being able to create an audit trail from it so that we can go back in time, use the forensic data that we've got, use all these aspects of uh, what we've collected and see at the, um, the end of the day what our users have been doing. We have to be able to actually get to it, use it, retain it and update it. So we want to think about audit log backup. How do we do, it, do these things? How do we create, control and manage it all. So lots of fun, isn't it? We also need to think about clipping, so baselining where we are at any particular point in time. Event monitoring, hardware monitoring, fault detections, uh, when things fail, a server's up or down. It's not just about security monitoring when we're talking about this. Remember, part of security is availability. So if a hard drive fails, that's actually a problem as well. We're not just going to go, oh, someone hacked my server. The fact that a hard drive's failed in our RAID system and now we're running on a critical level because we're only RAID 5, we're not RAID 10, and that one hard drive needs to be replaced means we are well, hopefully going to monitor and see the changes so that we can jump in there and do something quickly. We also need to think about protecting our organization from legal problems, peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer software, for instance, copyright music. We don't want any of that appearing and inappropriate content. None of us want to have an organization that gets in trouble. Well, at least I hope we don't. Then, are people actually doing their job? Now games is one possible, but at the end of the day, games is, well, maybe, maybe not. Depends on who you're hiring and all of that sort of stuff. So we have everything from warning banners. No, you don't um, have to worry about people not no, break into your system or not just because you have warning banners. If you have a warning banner, great. It means under US law, you're a protected computer. But if you don't have one, it doesn't mean someone has the right to jump on and use your computer. So um, Benjamin's talking about Patch Tuesday and saying how every Tuesday of every um, every second Tuesday of every month, Microsoft releases new patches, but testing the patches becomes a challenge because of the timing and everything like that. What could be the best approach? 
Ooh, again, that one's a difficult one. You're, no, let's put that one on the forum because I don't know how many machines you have, what sort of domain you have, all of those sort of fun things. So it's a lot different when you're talking about um, one admin and 10 machines versus uh, 100 admins and 10,000 machines and that sort of thing. But even then, uh, there are all the testing scenarios. One thing you can look at doing would be having a, um, uh, a test platform where you roll it out to and have trial or advanced users. Look at staging patches differently. Look at the critical ones versus non-critical ones. Also, you have to think about when you're going to do it versus any threat or anything like this. So, um, Keystroke monitoring is not illegal. Well, it depends. Keystroke monitoring, you need to understand it both from the good and bad. Keystroke monitoring can be illegal, David. Keystroke monitoring varies depending on what you're doing it for. Traffic analysis, trend analysis, and all these things also help. We even have the physical side of it with closed circuit television. So, um, but threat analysis is an ongoing activity. So where Graham's saying, um, uh, what we're trying to do with OPSEC is threat analysis must be ongoing, continually monitored and all the rest. Uh, yes, it is politically motivated quite often, but at the end of the day, it is an operational thing. Risk is not a project generally. Risk is all about maintaining systems over time and getting better over time. So. Monitoring tools and techniques. We need to think about what occurs, a problem identification, resolution, and all of this sort of fun stuff. So failure, recognition, response, etc., and getting all this in place. Intrusion detection, prevention, and authentication, detection, and data extraction, and also intrusion response. So once we have stopped things, or we are monitoring it, or whatever else, we need to think about how we respond to it, remember. Remember different types of intrusion detection. We can look at pattern recognition, baselines, anomaly detection. So behavior-based things, signature identification, such as many of the ones like Snort or um, whatever else, network and host-based, and we've even got embedded firewall stuff. I know they call it hardware, but I still say that it's software, but anyway. We have to think about how we handle violations and breaches. Over time, we're going to find that incidents are going to occur. We have new methods of attacks. All things that we thought in the past are the past. New things will always occur. Just because we innovate in security doesn't mean that we're going to beat the bad guys because they're also innovating as well. They are improving. They are getting further ahead. They are out there and doing stuff. So we have remote logging for a start. We don't want everything sitting on our own server. If we have it all sitting on one server that we're running, then what do we do? Problems. So we need to know about threshold reporting and what a goal happens to be. So to go over what this is about, standards, guidelines, and procedures really are used to define what we're going to do in our organization. And operational security is putting the, the things in place, the goals or whatever else, that really go right throughout the life cycle of our, our systems. So right from deployment to disposal. And we need to maintain this and we need to monitor it and ensure good governance using auditing and monitoring. So when we're looking at this chapter, see many of these are standalone concepts. But at the same time, it's really about a day-to-day -day task that we're going to need to keep doing. If we don't, this is where we're going to have problems. We need to make sure that people understand this is ongoing. This happens day-to-day, -day, and we're trying to ensure systems, networks, and environments are correctly updated, correctly secured, and this is very important. Anyone want to hazard a guess why this is not just going to be something we want to do once and move on? Why we're able to keep going and get better? Why it matters that this is not a project? 
Anyone have a guess at that one? And remember, overlap here is in this case because this is the daily implementation of all these other things we've been talking about. So, concepts. What we want to do is do all these things with administrative management, separation of duty, job rotation, mandatory vacation, and least privilege. Ensure that they're always in place. And yes, everything gets compromised, as Darren said. Hopefully not as often as we'd, uh, we, we want to try and reduce it, but hopefully not too much. And everything is changing. It is an arms race. It is a game. They get better, we get better. They get better, we get better. And we constantly, and I mean constantly, move through all of this over time, getting better as they get better. What we did 10 years ago is completely different to what we do now. Anyone who remembers back in the day, what we used to do for security was terrible, horrendously awful. And I'll say that now because what we thought we did was horrible. I remember back in the 90s, even the stuff I used to do with the um, stock exchange was horrendously bad compared to what we do now. It's amazing we survived back then, but we did because the attackers had no idea about all these things that they could do. And we had no idea about these things we could protect. So it's a never-ending game. Our, our changes that we, we have to face mean new things. So did I ever work for DEC? Uh, no, I didn't ever work for DEC. I worked for um, um, a system integrator that did stuff with DEC and um, implemented um, uh, PDP-8s and PDP-11s and uh, worked on one for Courier Mail even up there in Brisbane. But that's a different lifetime. Okay, so we need to have ongoing monitoring. It is part as uh, we've just had pointed out in the thing here of the SDLC and we need to ensure that we do move through and we do keep improving and we keep moving forward. So what is our security administrator? Now this is a person not hopefully reporting to the network admin, not reporting to the system administrator. Why? Because it should be independent. These are the people looking at the security of the system. Ah, oh, so we got someone uh, up there, Simon, who used to work for DEC in Brisbane, remembering old Queensland newspapers, and we won't even go into that one. The, um, the fact that they had to have a um, forklift once to actually lift up this old um, uh, PDP machine. Horrible, horrible um, way of running things, but it wasn't my fault, that's all I have to say. Okay, so I was only in my 20s back then, so all sorts of terrible things occurred. And I was just a, um, a monkey who ran around uh, changing bits of hardware and code and whatever. Anyway, security administrator, responsibility, implement, maintain. Make sure we assess the security of things. Implement, maintain access and review the logs. So where our network security guy is putting these things in place and making sure that we have logs, then we have to have them reviewed. We don't want the same person doing it, so we want different levels of it so that we can have accountability so we can actually come back and see who's been doing it so we want to look at these things when we're looking at logs we want to think about who is there anything repetitive that's been a problem over time do we have a whole lot of access to restricted information how do we look at that and control it over time so clipping levels this is an important term for those who haven't um, really gone into a clipping level. What we're looking at is normal levels of occurrence. So if someone logs into a system and they, they screw up and they come back and they screw up and they come back, what is normal? How many errors would be normal for someone? If you break into a system, what is normal for a bad guy? And we want to look at that and try and understand thresholds. But these thresholds should not be distributed and known by the, um, the bad guys, end users or anything else. Because when people know what the threshold is, that's when they can start scamming the system and bypassing it. So we want to keep it secret. So assurance levels, you need to understand assurance. Operational assurance versus lifecycle assurance. How we compare products and 
enable secure day-to-day -day use. What we're trying to do here is make sure that over time we control access to a level that we're understanding is good from a risk point of view. It, we can accept the loss with whatever else. So IPL mainframe term, this is the initial booting phase. What we're, we're doing is thinking about how we load everything up for the first time. So boot sequence should not be enabled for normal users to reconfigure. Now what I mean for that is our users, if we're talking about our machines, not BYO, uh, BYOD or anything like this, but our servers or anything like that, should not be set up so that users can jump in and do whatever with them. They shouldn't be able to um, recreate. They shouldn't be able to um, get in there and change things. Reason for this, if they can, they can bypass controls. If they can get onto a Linux machine, they can boot it into a CD or a DVD or a USB or whatever else and change the admin password or load code or something else. So we need to be able to have something in place so that we have secure booting so that our logs are not redirected and altered. And what we shouldn't be able to do is just reboot as we want. We also need to make sure that we have trusted recovery. So when we have an operating system or app crash, we don't want everything going into an insecure state. One of the problems that we had back in the day, like um, early versions, say version 2 of, of Checkpoint Firewall, um, back when we were installing that, would be people would try and DOS the system and make it crash because the firewall came up open. And that meant people could try and get some packets through your firewall while it's got no policy on it not good. So looking at how we reboot and making sure that we um, uh, maintain that is important. So crash steps, one thing we might want to have to do is, is investigate mis uh, machines and systems. If we have multiple machines and we're doing multiple things, then, then maybe we can jump in there and check what we're doing. So go into system uh, single user mode, validate what's happening, fix anything, fix critical files, uh, look at tripwire, should know Tripwire already, we've covered it. Uh, check the integrity, make sure everything's working. Make sure that we have operational controls in place, that um, all our input and output are, well, basically secured. So ensure that we actually put in, um, well, usernames against any transaction, that we can't put false information into it, that we validate all our input. So input validation is particularly important in this day of SQL injection. When we're opening up our system to the internet, to the world, then we need to make sure that we validate all those checks out there and control them. We need to make sure that we harden our systems before we put them on there, get rid of unused accounts, get rid of compilers, get rid of operating systems. Um, or say if we have different um, software that we're not using. If you do a full install of Linux, there's so many things that um, it's not funny that are installed by default. Um, so for an admin taking mandatory vacations, does it mean that we have to disable their VPN access as well? That's going to depend on the organization, of course. So, um, but if you want them to go away and not do um, work and, and not be the ones controlling systems, then potentially maybe have them cut off or I have them um, have to dial in and um, grab a pin from someone before you leave, that sort of thing. So we need to restrict physical access, secure the console, use physically different servers, VMs, whatever else. Ensure that remote access security is in place. Look at um, how we control these things, especially as we're going into mobile systems. How do we encrypt data? How do we protect things? How do we ensure that we have remote access protected and controlled? So if we're looking at network or business systems, how do we ensure that we have the configuration in place that is managed? So change control again comes into being a big aspect of this. When we're looking at Sarbanes-Oxley, when we're looking at ensuring that PCI DSS is uh, met, APRA here in Australia, whatever else, then we need to ensure that we actually implement this in a way that, well, doesn't open us up to security vulnerabilities. So 
change control, uh, we're going to start by requesting a change. So someone should, it's like a, a management project of some sort. Change control is a project. So we, we start by putting why we're doing it. We scope out the change, say this is what we want to do, this is the impact, this is what we're going to have to um, get, any testing we need, etc. After we have that, it's like any other project, we have to have approval on our chain, uh, our potential change. So our change control is then approved for what we're doing. We document that, say what we're doing and why, test it. Now documentation can be automated, it can be a wiki or anything else, but at the end of the day, it needs to be something we can go back and refer to. Once we have tested it, we need to find out anything that is wrong, maybe go back and change it. Then implement any changes we have. So find out why, find out what we have, good, bad or indifferent, and work through it. And then, of course, we're going to report the changes we do. We don't save them, then no one knows about them. So media, also want to make sure that we have our backup, our hard drives, um, all controlled correctly, and that also goes right to media destruction. So sanitization, whether we're looking at degaussing, degaussing are a big um, electromagnetic um, device that basically um, uh, plays with the little ones and zeros on the thing by um, um, sending it up way up into to the stratosphere of um, magnetism and then whacking it back down again so that hopefully we have no information left to read. We can purge things. We can take things through extraordinary means to do that, whether it's um, burning it, annealing it, whatever. We can look at zeroation, overwriting it. So um, they tell you still to do multiple passes. I can tell you that's BS uh, for the simple fact that I'm one of the people who did the um, uh, research behind it. and. Um, you only need to do one pass, no one can actually grab it. So heating the drive to Curie point, so it loses magnetism is another one. Yes, if you um, whack it into uh, something um, that works, like a, um, a pottery kiln is a good one, depending on how many you need to do. So resource availability. At the end of the day, we need to make sure that we're actually able to have people connect to us. So availability is the overlooked part of security, but it's extremely important. We need to have fault tolerant um, equipment, hardware redundance, service level agreements potentially from our providers, operational procedures, how we're going about it, what we're doing, not letting people just pull switches out and change them during the middle of the day, all of that stuff. And once again, we come back to mean time between failures, so we can work out how often things are going to fail. So if we're looking at um, hard drives, if we've got a thousand hard drives around our organization and the mean time before failure is uh, one million hours, we can start looking at how many we expect to have over a particular period of time. So in a year we need to have so many spare ones. So what we're looking at is an average, how many we need. So mean time to repair is another statistic we should get. So how long does it take to maybe get a replacement hard drive and if we're talking about maybe a month before we get something and it's critical and we're expecting one of these to fail every now and again then we might have to have one just sitting there waiting and we don't want to have too many failures in a redundant system. So single point of failure, what's this mean? What are some examples? So I'll get some people to put some examples of single points of failure uh, into there. So. I'll give you the typical one, which is a single ISP that uh, Kyle has just done. Um, a single hard drive is another one, but think of some others as we're talking. So HSRP, anyone want to have a guess at um, uh, that routing protocol, what it's used for? RAID, rate, so tape, not so much anymore. Virtualization, grid computing, SANS and NAS. So yeah, we want to make sure that we don't have single network paths from our edge to our routers or anything like that. We don't want to have single network administrators, single ISPs and all the rest. So we need to understand RAID, redundant array of inexpensive disks. So RAID 0 is striping, we'll show a visual and um, of that and mirroring in the next slide. In um, RAID, fast access, no redundancy and it actually means we have less secure systems. 
bigger drives, but if one fails, both fail. Mirroring, so we have uh, copies of our data. It's expensive, faster than um, single disk stuff. We can lose a disk and um, all the rest, but of course, it's going to be more expensive. In RAID 0, we're putting two drives in to get a bigger drive. In RAID 1, it's one-to-one -one copy. So we have other ones, and I'll flip through to this in a second. RAID 5, uh, we've shown some of this, of course, already. But uh, what we're doing is Stripe sets with parity. So we lose a disk, and we're in critical mode. Um, HS, so HRSP, uh, hot standby, is that a Cisco proprietary? Um, it was a proprietary, I don't think it is any more, I mean there are a lot of other vendors that are also doing HSRP, um, including Checkpoint for some of their things and the Nokia boxes and whatever else we're doing um, uh, had uh, not only VSSP and uh, VSRP and, uh, but also HSRP, so uh, hot standby uh, there are a number of vendors up now. I'm not sure whether they do it by licensing or anything like that, but I'm not quite sure. All right, RAID 5, Stripe sets with parity. So what we have here is uh, looking at effectively what we're doing. This is the easy to explain way, block, 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 and a parity. What we're really doing though is parity goes across each of our disks. So if we lose any one of these, so we lose block 1A, 1B, 1C, then we have a parity block here that does 1C, a parity block here that does 1B, a parity block, etc. So we can basically uh, lose one of these and recreate based on all of this. So what we're actually losing isn't the entirety. Our parity block enables a bit of information to be stored across everything. And as it said in the simplified version here, what we're doing effectively is having a spare of all our drives. So we have A, B and C, four different blocks and a bit of them each. So overall, have our four drives as an example. Not the only way we can do RAID 5, of course. We can do it with different levels and, and many other things. But we lose one drive, then we're still up. So other things, direct attached storage, which is the old way of doing it. Now we're moving into NAS and SAN. So NAS is uh, file level at the network, and SAN is disk block file sharing, uh, sharing for dedicated storage networks, etc. So we also can think of clustering, active, passive, where we have a primary with a heartbeat and a backup. In this case, what we have is a primary there with a live backup that is um, set by heartbeat so that we have um, machines accessing things and failing over as they're needed. So main machine, backup machine. We can also cluster multiple machines, server one, two, whatever else, all working at the same time. But we need to ensure that we don't overdo any of them. So if we lose one, well, we don't have too much load and everything fails. We also have covered in the past a little bit on um, BCP with backups. This needs to be done regularly, it needs to be done often, and it needs to be done well, or we're going to have many problems. So needs to be stored in multiple locations and backed up correctly or, well, don't work. So contingency planning is very similar to BCP, although contingency planning is how we recover from a small incident. This is not the disaster type stuff. This is, we're still actually running. Nothing is broken apart from part of a server. So if, for instance, we have a drive in our RAID array fail, how do we make sure that that doesn't become a disaster? If we have a server failure, part of our cluster, how do we ensure that it's not going to cause us too many problems? Power outage, etc. How effective are virtual servers? It appears that the actual physical uh, backup drive is superior. Um, Oh, that depends. So how effective is a virtual server? Well, 
how well have you set them up? If you have a really good virtual infrastructure um, that is mirrored and all the rest, and the backup physical system behind it is good, then your virtual system is good. But any virtual system is only as good as the actual physical hardware it is put onto. So if you have a virtual system and it's only running on a RAID 0 system where they've spanned things to save money, they're too bad. One goes, everyone goes. So you need to make sure that you actually have it in place correctly. So contingency planning is all about maintaining things. Do you need contingency planning for BCP? No. Contingency planning is similar, but it is recovering from small incidents. To ensure things over time, you need to think about how you go about it, but it's part of it. It's not the whole of BCP. BCP is um, making sure business goes on as normal. So moving from contingency to BCP is thinking about at a smaller level for contingency. Remember again, SSL, VPNs, all the rest. We've just had Black Hat. Lots of people running around um, doing all their attacks over things bit. Now, what we need to ensure is we protect all the security of um, what we're doing, all the access of um, email, etc. We don't really have any true security over email, and we need to think about this. We need to think about all the different things that people hack into our systems with. So pen testing and all the rest, all out there. We need to think about session attacks, man in the middle, war bombing, no, sorry, war dialing and mail bombing, ping of death, oversized ICMP packets, so a little bit of reading there, and penetration testing. Well, what we're trying to do here is simulating attacks on network, discovery of problems, enumerating problems, mapping and exploiting all those vulnerabilities, and the most important part of this is report to management. At the end of the day, if we don't report what we're doing, then too bad. It doesn't really make any difference. So we need to think about what type of penetration testing we're doing, whether we're doing it as blind or targeted or whatever else. Now, is it advisable for small business to have a contingency plan in place? Yes. But what for is going to be part of your BCP. So you're going to have business continuity in place first and then you're going to set up your RAID and you're going to have other things and then how you deal with that, well, depends on the size of your organization. Okay, at this point, before we go on to the next one, we're just going to have a couple minute break. So any questions or anything else you want to deal with while we're here um, and we will be starting back in about two minutes. So it's very quick, run out there and, and get whatever you need bit. And we'll go back to it shortly. So let's have a look at some of these questions we have here. Um, unfortunately, I've got a lot of stuff, Mick, that we put into a little bit of time. So um, lots of material to cover. So in the next iteration of this that I'll be also bringing out very shortly, um, in about a month, you'll have even more. So um, hmm. unfortunately, I, I can't do too much at the moment because limited time. Hardening the system... Uh, isn't bad. If you disable the service, great. I mean, one of the things we need to ensure that we're doing is locking down and disabling any services we have. Um, at the end of the day, if you don't have it running, then it can't be compromised. Fairly simple. So anyway, our next aspect for the day that we're going to get into in just a moment is um, physical security. So we'll get to that in just a minute. 
Okay, so does different size of discs affect the RAID, say RAID 5 with three discs? Uh, yes, very much so. Uh, you should basically have uh, the same size discs in your RAID. Um, Anton's blog is extremely good for SIM type stuff, a SIM. I agree with that one. And sounds like cloud hosting with a certified ISP, server's domain with the redundancy and internet connection would be the lowest overhead in, um, in terms of security for business. It depends and how much risk you're willing to take and what you're going to protect. If you're talking about small data connections, then something like Amazon is probably going to be your best bet. But if you're talking about a petabyte of data, um, per petabyte Amazon costs you about $2 million a year. So um, you can do it cheaper. So um, not everyone needs a petabyte of stored data. So depends on what you're doing. So what is HSRP? Uh, HSRP is one of these uh, different technologies that allow you to basically have hot swap. So. Uh, we're looking at hot swap routing protocol, so one or the other uh, up at any time. There are a number of different ways of doing this, such as um, BGP or OSPF for internal networks. Uh, this is where you have a couple different ISPs and you can flick over them at different times. Um, Amazon Web Services doesn't advertise the cost and there's a good reason. It's expensive. It's not terribly cheap. So like everything else, you pay for it. Alrighty. Hopefully everyone's got their tea, coffee, whatever else. Um, and at the same time, I'm going to wave my hands here in the background and, and say, um, can I have one and so that I can refuel as we're talking. So. I have my lovely assistant there going off to grab me a coffee. Isn't it great being the person with the headset on? <laughs> At least in part. So got to make sure that I stay all happy, joyous and bouncy so that we can get back into this. And we're going to start with physical security. This is an area that many people overlook and don't do terribly well. Now, environmental security, this is these bits here. You're expected to know the threats, vulnerabilities and countermeasures used to physically protect enterprise resources. Okay, so all these things. So we're looking at knowing how we can create a secure site, how we go about ensuring no unauthorized access, how we protect people, how we ensure safety, etc. So I've got a, a thing here, uh, VRRP and CARP are analogies to VSRP, not OSBF and PGP. Um, yes and no. So VRRP and CARP are similar to HSRP in that um, it's a hot swap type protocol and whatever else. But at the same time, if you think about what OSBF and PGP are for, we're not talking about uh, whether we can swap an exact um, one for one type scenario. If we're talking about RAID or uh, different things in different sites is also another way of talking about the same thing. Don't think about the technologies. Think about the end goal. This is a management certification, Paul. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what technology is functionally equivalent. What can you actually get the same design from? What are the vulnerabilities of the ACDC outlet and how can it be managed? Um, well, some of the physical bits, someone could plug something in and cause problems. All right, anyway, getting back to this, we have interruption of services. Theft, physical damage, unauthorized access, loss of system integrity. The copper wires do have problems. Someone can backhoe the things. I've had it happen before. Someone can overload them. We can have all these other threats that we have here. Natural environmental threats. We can have interruptions to power. So the ACDC top copper wires, whatever else, can be um, impacted by man-made 
um, just disgruntled employee stuff. We can have politically motivated threats, strike, civil disobedience, uh, someone ripping wires out of the wall. One of the best ones, um, in the pa distant past now, or not so distant really, I did a little bit of stuff in Africa. And um, in Africa, they um, have all these little wires being laid. And um, strangely enough, copper was actually expensive for a time. So one way of making money was ripping the copper wire out of the ground. One thing that um, some of the people there doing it didn't understand was fiber optic wire can't be melted down quite the same way as copper wire can be. So uh, organization that um, I was involved with had a whole lot of fiber optic ripped out of the ground because people thought that it was copper and they could sell it. So all sorts of things can occur and do occur. Physical security oops, sorry, is all about ensuring that we make sure that we protect the safety first and then the security second. So uh, analog copper versus fiber optics. So is there a threat from plugging into ACDC? Well, if you plug into the wrong area and your power is not good, uh, is someone going to break into it or hack you via ACDC? Unlikely, unless you're doing one of these um, um, network over power type things. But we're talking about generally uh, someone being able to spike the system, brownouts, etc. All right, physical security is important, extremely important. Now, if you don't have the right security in place, no amount of technical, administrative or whatever else control is going to help you. Physical security is harder and more complex. It's not about protecting just data, but people. Now, an example, we're starting to move to virtualized currency. Virtualized currency means we have um, all these little devices that we're going to have to protect. We're going to have hard drives and we want to maybe have those offline. Now, an example here would be um, one that I'm involved with is Bitcoin. Bitcoin, we have wallets, wallets stored on hard drives and all the rest. Now, do you want to carry a wallet with all your cash in it? At the end of the day, maybe if you're buying things, you keep on your local unprotected computer, a few thousand dollars. So where do you put your actual store? So we can go back into hard drives and physical vaults, somewhere to put everything. So physical security cannot be an afterthought. So if we do, we can have some problems. Examples, banks with bushes and other things that obscured access bad lighting and all the rest, allowed people to be sued. So banks could be sued in the past because, well, someone got mugged uh, putting an ATM in the wrong place, then, well, someone had their money stolen, got beaten up and all the rest. The ATM was done for that. Improper underground um, garage lighting. People can get attacked and things like this. So we want to make sure that we have the safety aspects covered. It's an important area we need to address. If we have too many signs, too many things covering our windows, then people can't see through that window. The view is obstructed and someone might rob it. Uh, ooh, let's see, all these physical security threats. And we've had more and more out there, easy to see. I'm sure we've all seen Katrina. We've all seen the effects what can happen where things go wrong. Not just bushfires, not just floods, not just whatever else, but if we don't secure the environment properly, we fail. So we need to think about power outage, water, gas, um, land connections, man-made threats, explosives, disgruntled employees, and politically motivated threats as well. If we can't get into the building, we can't do things. Just the other week while I was in town, there was a, 
I don't even know what they were protesting about, but there are a whole lot of people running up and down the road with little placards here in Sydney, waving things about, uh, complaining, bitching, and all the rest about something. Uh, all I need to um, say about it is if you wanted to get in and do things, it made it hard. A street was blocked off as people waved their little placards about. So we need to think about how we get around all of that. And life safety goals are our number one priority. Remember this one. Number one, first thing we're trying to do, ensure that we are protecting the people involved. Then we can look at defense and depth, how we layer these different bits and pieces of um, control together to make a holistic whole. So physical uh, security helps address all of the CIA fundamental principles. And in this, it has to be cost effective. We don't have unlimited budgets. We can't go through these things in an unlimited way. Risk analysis has to occur on physical access as well. Probabilities need to be calculated, and there's a lot of stuff that we can do. We don't need to know an exact calculation. We just need to know that we are improving. So if we have a range, so we have a 95% confidence interval that says we have between 95 and $105 uh, dollar potential loss, K dollar, um, then if we can then look at doing something as a cost-effective thing, spending $20,000 and reducing our potential loss to between fifty and sixty thousand dollars at a ninety five percent confidence interval, then we have made an improvement. We don't need to say we have exactly this loss. This is where people go wrong. A range of losses is good enough. And in fact, that's all we get in physics. We have a range. Just sometimes it's down to six zeros or whatever else in physics. So, planning process, we want to think about how we deter people, how we reduce and avoid damage, how we detect what's occurring, motion sensors, whatever else, and we assess any incidents, guards run out there and do things, and we respond to it, put out the fire, get law enforcement, etc. So, we want to plan this, avoid problems as much as possible. It's all risk analysis. At the end of the day, all of this is about creating a layered approach that minimizes risk. This is the old castle-based approach, not as a technology, but as a physical thing. How do we get these barriers around our organization? How do we make sure that we've hardened our organization and protected what we're doing? How do we improve the enjoyment and aesthetics of our environment. How do we use this? Now, one of the older ways that have been around since the 60s is CPTED, Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. So what we're talking about here is proper design of physical environment helps reduce crime. I don't know if anyone here has been to the Microsoft, Google, or whatever else type campuses. Um, I'm lucky enough to have um, been over to um, uh, Microsoft and, and worked um, with some of them and been interviewed by some of them and done things in the past over in Microsoft's main campus. Um, in particular, I was over there with their, uh, met their click fraud team and things like this and, um, and others. Um, their campus over there is quite nifty. I haven't actually seen the Google Piermont site but Craig's saying is, I'm assuming that the Google site there is the same one as the um, the Californian site, or at least similar. Um, I I think they generally model them in the same sorts of ways. But um, as an example, looking at the Microsoft one, it's pretty. It's designed so that you don't think about the security that's in place when you walk around Microsoft. What you have are all these little gardens and it's a campus type approach and you don't even think that you're being monitored. It's out there and it uses CPTED, so Crime Prevention Through Environmental Design. It's designed so that if you're a criminal, you're not going to feel too comfortable. So how should a, a two-step authentication be created without stressing the user? Well. 
what we want to try and do is build something, um, maybe a smart card plus a pin, so that it's easy, something they have, etc. cetera. Um, a smart card with a fingerprint that works. Always ways of doing it. it it's a cost-benefit analysis at the end of the day. Um, Mick saying the AFP can provide uh, free CPTED assessments. Um, I know they do that for government guys, um, Mick. Do they do it for everyone and their dog, though? I didn't think they do it for um, just small organisations. Uh, they probably do it for large ones. Uh, I, I know they do it for large ones out there, especially if you're critical infrastructure. But hmm. okay, so neighbourhood watch and what are it? Oh, very good. I didn't even know. I, I knew they did it for large stuff, but thank you, Mick. Um, the Australian Federal Police help with CPTED assessments. Very good. So CPTED has been around since the 60s. It, it's so Graham, um, who knows about the New South Wales Police, there's some uh, state police do it, New South Wales Police in Sydney. Yes, that's another true one too. So this has been around for a while. If we get this one right, it gets rid of a lot of the problems. Now, if you think about what we're looking for, we want to make it uncomfortable for anyone doing something wrong. We don't want you to easily slink around the organisation and, well, steal stuff, do things wrong. We want to make it so that you can reduce the problems. <laughs> All right, so hedges and planters should not be more than 2.5 feet tall. So when we're implementing all this, we have it so that you can't really hide behind them and you can see everything, but it's an obstacle. I mean, at the end of the day, um, from personal experience in the Microsoft and Google sites over in, in, in there, it's really cool. It looks pretty. You actually want to be there. It's a great way of doing it. If you do it right, you can have a really pretty looking garden that's out there, but you're not going to stand there without someone noticing you. So street furniture should encourage people to sit and watch what's going around you. So in Microsoft site, they have all these little areas where you can have picnic lunches and see what's going on. They encourage you to be there at the work. They, they have street furniture that um, helps you watch different protected areas. So you use the environment to help you protect your center. So when you're creating a data center, don't stick it against the wall. Don't have the windows out there displaying everything you're doing. So what we're trying to do is use natural access control, natural surveillance, and territorial reinforcement together to add protection. So natural access control, this is um, guidance of people leaving and entering a space. Uh, unfortunately, um, it's used a lot in the casino industry. Uh, for those who don't know anything about me, I used to do a lot of work in yeah, with casinos like Lasseter's and um, uh, even Playboy and and other people like that. Um, a little bit. In, I mean, I used to do a lot of Las Vegas trips and and fun things because casinos pay a lot of money for security guys. That's all I have to say. Um, so you go where the money is, and I don't really care if people want to spend their money, but they are very, very good with natural access control. Using CCTVs and all of the rest, and looking at where you're going to put these things in, whether they're real or false, and helping control. So in Jack's example here, CCTV should be on. One store got sued in the US for having a false CCTV showing a false sense of security and the um, customer was wounded. Yeah, well what we're trying to do is make people feel more secure because we're actually doing something. We're controlling it right. Make the bad guys feel less secure. Not necessarily false stuff, but clear line of sight, discouragement of offenders, natural barriers. One of the things that, going back to Microsoft and how they do this well, is it's a big, long, meandering path. If you're the bad guy trying to get in there, you're out in the open for a long time. 
you don't just jump over and run through all the hedges. Well, you can, but then people are going to notice very quickly, security guards come, etc. We have natural surveillance, so we want to make it easy to observe the criminals out there. Anyone who's doing something slinking around or whatever else is going to be seen. So some of the people like Graham here in the, uh, the background will have a lot of experience with some of this, um, working with natural surveillance, what we're doing in um, how we do it to discourage people wanting to mill around entry points, mill around sensitive areas. So no, it's not against the um, Australian law to use a dummy CCTV, but you should also ensure that you're doing it in a way that protects people, not just sticking them up there and making customers feel better, but not actually doing anything to stop the bad guys. So we want to have a sphere of influence. Now this is where companies like Google and everything do really, really well. Employees feel they own the space. Funky, whatever else, but the aim is this is our company. This is where we work. And that means criminals start feeling vulnerable. They don't belong. If you have this funky environment where people know that this is my organization and I'm going to protect it, then the crims feel a bit vulnerable. They're watched. So we do this, decorating walls, fencing, landscaping, lighting, company signs, decorative walks, um, and even activities. So people don't seem to think that these little company activities we do, when we start cutting them because we think, oh, well, times are tight, it doesn't cost much to have a Friday afternoon barbecue, does it, guys? It doesn't. I tell you now, not expensive, and they matter. Having that lunch or whatever else where you have people out for an hour a day, well, once a month, you're trying to get people to want to belong. And as Graham said, it is expectation that you're going to get caught. We're not really going to make you think that you're part of all this. The real deal is um, territorial reinforcement, as Darren said. We're trying to make it look like we are part of the organization when we are part of the organization, that we are not part of it when we're not, etc. So what we want to try and do is design using CPTED and then look at target hardening. Okay, so where appropriate, we harden the target. Through this, we're going to do something that helps, well, make us more secure. At the end of the day, we are going to harden our target after we've made it less necessary to harden it. So try and break things into zones. Use physically separate areas and make these our security zones. Have our entry area, our secure area where our developers work, our payroll area, whatever else, and isolate these things. For anyone who's ever gone around the um, uh, Langley building at the CIA, what you'll, you'll notice is there's not a lot of internal security in the traditional sense. You get into the building, and yes, you're monitored and all that sort of fun stuff, but you can go all over the place. You can walk around. But um, Craig saying, uh, been there? Well, you'll know then that you have these sheets at the end of the day. So there's no, it's not clear desk policy, and NSA are similar, but you, you chuck a sheet over your desk. And that's monitored. And you get in a lot of trouble if you lift someone else's sheet. It's a nice simple thing. You walk away from your desk, you chuck a sheet over it, it's protected because you're trusted. Although there are a few people going around um, uh, untrusted in the world at the moment who uh, should have been less trusted, it seems. But while you're in there, people know it's procedural not to lift that sheet. Even if you've got your computer logged in or whatever else, 
just throw a sheet over the top. Doesn't seem too secure, does it? But the reality is, it's really hard to break in and steal information on someone's computer if you can't see the screen, if you can't use the keyboard. So the simple thing is, even if it's not locked or anything like that, if anyone ever catches you picking up that sheet, um, they don't quite shoot you, but it's close enough. So we can have our zones. We can isolate these things. Designing physical security program, well, what we're going to do is look at the HVAC, air conditioning, all the rest. Make sure that we have the right construction materials, power distribution, communication line, having hazardous material controlled. Uh, how close are we to things like airports, highways, roads, emergency services? So, um, at the end of the day, how long is it going to be before police come and knock on our door. At the end of the day, if we have a, an area where we want people to respond, we need to know how long it's going to be before they respond. So being able to report on that, understand it, whatever else, means working with law enforcement as well. So we want to have facilities that, um, well, allow us to control the security there. If we have an on-site data center, then we need to be able to protect it, or maybe we put it with someone else. What things can occur, natural disasters, um, floods, hurricanes, etc. Accessibility, what do we have, roads, traffic access, etc. And knowing the crime rate in our area is also important. So when we construct a building, what are we making it out of? Are we putting it into somewhere where we can store documents, hard drives, etc.? And you should go through the different construction areas. Um, I'll be loading some material up for you to read. Uh, if you want to do the exam, then it's an area you really need to memorize. It's just a rote learning task, uh, so I won't go through it in too many details. Um, entry points are another one. We need to think of all the different ways into buildings, and it's not just doors. So why so many organizations use best physical security, CCTV? Um, CCTV is cheap. So I don't know if it's the most effective, but it's cheap. That's why most people use it. Anyway, entry points. We need to think about Windows, ventilation ducts, um, making sure that we actually have a door that is strong. Um, if we have a big strong steel door but weak hinges, and I've seen that one before, and using internal hinges on an external door, then it comes off too bad. Also need to think about fire codes. Doors well, they're not all the same. Just because you see that expensive versus cheap one, you have to think about where you're putting it. And hollow versus solid core doors mean whether someone can kick a hole through it, punch through it, or not get in. So um, doors need to have the right sort of locks. Do they have automatic locks? Um, do they fail open or fail closed? Fail open, for instance, well, something goes wrong, everyone can get in and out. File closed, locks up, no one can get in, no one can get out sometimes. Maybe it's one way open, one way closed. Various different things we need to do. We've covered man traps in the, uh, in the past a little bit as well. We need to think about this to stop piggybacking. We don't want people going in and out of our organization. Need to think about different types of glass. We have the standard glass on the residential home easy to break, not too hard to get through. Tempered glass, heated, cooled, whatever else. The last place I lived had tempered glass um, and it was a bugger to replace when the um, removal guy backed a chair into it and put a crack. Cost over $1,000 for a window. It was annoying. So if the building is located in a traffic area affected by gridlock, emergency service or employee, employees can get affected. Definitely, you need to think about where you are and how long. Now, one thing you can actually do, most insurance organizations have all the statistics you need, and um, they won't necessarily give it to you for free, but 
it is available. You can actually find out how long it is likely before you make a phone call uh, saying there's a fire to how long it will be before the fire people can get there. Something you might want to check. Acrylic glass, plexiglass and lexane, stronger than regular glass. We have glass with embedded wires um, to stop shattering. Laminated glass, two sheets of glass with plastic film between, harder to break. And um, we can also put films and tint to help with security. We need to make our computer rooms set up correctly. These are how we set up our servers, our racks, our equipment and all the rest. Equipment needs to be placed in locked racks if we're, um, uh, unless we we're in special computer rooms where can't be accessed or whatever else, even then we should consider locked racks. Computer room should be near the center of the building. Any idea why we might want to put our computer room in the center of the building, guys? Not at ground floor, ideally. Uh, above ground, not too high. Um, all that sort of stuff. Strict access control should be enabled. We should have one access door, but multiple fire doors. <coughs> So we should have positive air pressure. What this means is air goes out. There's higher pressure in the computer room than outside. So if something happens, if there's a fire or whatever else, we push everything out. We should have an emergency off switch if we need to. As much as it, it seems that we want to make sure that uh, everything stays up, if there's an electrical fire, we might have to hit everything and power down. Um, emanation security is a big one too. If anyone knows what tempest hardening is, uh, if you've done anything in some of these nice little um, buildings down there in Canberra, uh, even some of those that Mick works in uh, with the ATO and things, then emanation security is looking at what can leak. So um, uh, one of the things I enjoy having fun with every now and again is um, if you go to the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs and Trade, DFAT, there's a nice little four-letter agency. We have four-letter agencies because we're much better here in Australia than three-letter ones. We have extra letters. Um, there's a nice little, uh, not ASIO, but another starting with A organization in the DFAT building. And um, if you want to pick on them every now and again, they sometimes get things wrong. And you can go down and... Um, visit them and see what you can get and see how much trouble you can get yourself into. Especially when you four square from inside the buildings. And they don't like that one, strangely enough. Um, anyway, portable fire extinguishers, smoke, fire sensors, uh, making sure that you have them under the ground as well as in the roof. I mean, raised floors, well, Australian standard, all that. So we, uh, as Craig's pointed out, AS 2834-19 95 Australian standard, so for computer accommodation there. Water sensors should be under raised floors and ceilings, all that sort of fun stuff needs to be put in place. We need to make sure that the humidity, temperature, everything like that is controlled. Humidity is too high. Um, if we, uh, That can be a problem, corrosion of metal parts. Everyone understands that one quite well, but quite often we get the other problem not understood as well. Static electricity is a big problem. Now, I've done um, quite a bit of work with um, uh, people in funky places where static's a problem, like Lassiter's when they were around casino were in Alice Springs, and that's dry. And anyone who's been to Las Vegas, Las Vegas is dry. Computer rooms in Las Vegas have some huge problems. You actually need to humidify the computer room. Sounds strange, doesn't it? You're pumping water into the air of the computer room in Las Vegas and a lot of the casinos and everything over there. Any idea what happens if you don't? Why would you want to pump water into the air of your computer room? I mean, after all, electricity. Yeah, ESD. What's ESD? Static electricity. So yes, in some of these areas, you end up zapping everyone. It's really fun. And in um, Alice Springs, it was terrible. Uh, even with anti-static carpets and all sorts of things like that, we'd zap everyone all over the place. So we need to make sure that our computer room is on a separate electrical system, if 
possible. We need to have redundant power supplies, redundant everything else and control things. And we want to protect our assets. So don't leave luggage around when we're, um, uh, well, if we've got a laptop and it's got sensitive information, don't put it in checked baggage. Hold it. Take it with us. Password protect our BIOS. Harden our operating system. Inventory things. Make sure that we understand what we've got. Putting laptop serial numbers and all the rest. Install tracking software on our laptops. Lojack stuff. Anyone know what a Lojack type software is for um, tracking software and, and, um, and like laptops or tablets or anything like this? My phone even has a um, uh, thing. So yeah, GPS based one is um, an example. So alarm system must be located in a computer room. Motion access and a dual system dial up to satellite should be in place. Um, yeah, we should avoid compromise of all this stuff. Not a problem, Mick. All this will be recorded, so we'll see you online. So Lojack Computer Crace works with Windows because it uses WinRPC. Yeah, I know. Other ones work a bit better. Um, I've got... I won't go on, I'm not advertising anyone, but um, on my um, Android phone and tablet, I have uh, Lojack-based stuff that actually uh, locks into the, um, the firmware. So um, you have to actually uh, root my, my phone to um, get beyond that stuff, so it, it doesn't even appear to be there. All right, protecting assets. We need things like wall safes, floor safes, checks, depositories, vaults. And you need to understand the difference between each of those. A vault is a walk-in. A depository is a safe with a slot where you drop it in the front door. A chest is the old standalone thing. So we have different types of saves. We have internal support systems. We need to make sure we protect our power understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and many different power issues from blackouts, brownouts, um, right up to um, power spikes, power surges, etc. And we do this by having UPS, online and offline, standby, etc., power line conditioners and backup generators where we need to. So um, other things, like Apple has a solution that wipes your laptop if stolen. Yes, all those are good. Electric power issues. Interference, making sure that you have clean power, um, not any line noise. One of the things with um, doing forensic jobs is um, putting things in um, anti-emission bags. So if you take a phone to be um, analyzed, you drop it in there so it doesn't have 3G connection or whatever else, so that uh, it doesn't remote wipe on you, and you make sure that you do it in a little tempest cage so that no one does the remote wipe as you're trying to image the thing. All right, electric power issues. We also need um, EMI protection. Motors can generate fields. Not having microwaves, not having vacuum cleaners, not having all these things around you helps. Another one is fluorescent lights, making sure those awful, awful things are on different segments of the network. They're horrible things. I don't care about all those green stuff people t keep talking about. Ugh, fluorescent lights are horrible, horrible, horrible inventions that are designed to make our lives tough because they have frequency interference. If you've got a large enough network and whatever else, then you're going to have a whole lot of problems if you've got many, many fluorescent lights in there. Enough of them can cause you a nightmare. So make sure that you have some controls there. Electrical power issues, know the difference between spike surge, um, sort, uh, shortage, sags, dips, brownouts, faults, etc. So know all the difference between the power outage issues. Make sure that you also understand inrush current. For all of those who've um, turned everything off for some reason over the weekend and come in on a Monday morning, understand what happens when everyone turns on their computer. It's not just everyone trying to get the exchange server or something like this. Don't use microwaves on the same power system. They cause problems. So. Surge protectors on desktops. Don't daisy chain everything. Don't, um, oh, every, at the end of the day, basically try and control this in a way that matters and controls your system. So, environmental issues, water and gas, positive drains. Everything should flow out instead of in. Why? 
quite simple because if something goes wrong, we don't want it sucking into the computer room. And I've seen this one in the past where we have people um, trying to pump air the wrong way and the you know, something fails and uh, all the smoke gets pumped into the computer room. Humidity, we need to make sure that that's maintained and we use a hydrometer to measure that. Static electricity, well, it can be a big problem. Anyone who's um, seen those little anti-static things and all the rest needs to make sure that we have static bands and control it. We need to make sure the temperature is controlled. Um, for the test, it's in Fahrenheit, and so all the American bits, of course, we don't use Fahrenheit here in Australia, but temperature should be maintained. Ventilation should be closed loop recirculating and positive pressure. There are reasons for this. Basically, we want to control what we're doing so that we know all about the systems in place. Fire prevention should be in place. Fire detection, heat activated um, versus smoke activated. We need to ensure that we have a mix of these depending on, once again, risk. Okay, other things. We need to have things properly placed. Many organizations have gone in there and redesigned the organization and built their own without thinking about how you have fire control. If you put all those walls in place around an open plan office, the fire sprinkler and everything else may not be optimal anymore. We need to ensure that we have the right sort of fire suppression. Now, remember, all fire needs fuel, oxygen, and temperature. There are different ways to stop it. Fuel, well, soda acid, we can remove the fuel. Oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, low ox type ones, remove the oxygen, stop things burning. And temperature, well, if we flood things and reduce the temperature of water, it will also stop burning. So chemical combustion, um, gas, we can also pump in things like uh, things that interfere. So you need to know for the exam the different types of, well, classifier um, extinguishers, A, B, C, and D, and others as well. So A, the main ones you need, common uh, combustibles, wood, paper, laminates, all those fun things. B, liquid, uh, gas, CO2, dry, dry fire, uh, electrical, this is going to be the more common one that you're going to have as a standalone type thing in a computer room. Uh, at the end of the day, you don't want to use water um, in somewhere where people are going to get electrocuted. Combustible materials, sodium, potassium, you have dry powder. Um, so in the exam, will it be US standards for fire or European? Uh, no, unfortunately it's US. They, um, being a US organization, even though it's international, they, they just assume the rest of us are all US. So anyway, all right, fire suppression, halon gas, it's now banned, but we still find it all over the place, naughty, naughty, naughty. And HVAC systems should be set to shut down when these things occur. We don't want to keep pumping air in. So A, ash, B, boil, C, chemical, D, dry, K, kitchen. Very good. So Inogen replaced Hylon uh, five plus years ago. Yes, but um, unfortunately, there's still some places out there with um, illegal Halon out there. Um, not everyone's updated their things yet, and I won't mention a certain Sydney organization that hasn't. Big one. So automatic fire suppression. We also need to think about wet versus dry pipe, pre-action and deluge, and know the difference. Wet pipe, well, water's actually in there, dry pipe, it um, comes out when something occurs. You also need to understand terms such as a plenum. This is the term that is the area, the space between the ceiling and the actual floor above. So where that crawl space is called a plenum. So other things, perimeter security, understand different types of locks, fencing, lighting, bollards, etc. Locks, locks delay. They don't stop. The purpose of a lock is purely to delay intruders. We, we want to stop people long enough so that we can detect them and do something. There are mechanical combination locks and cipher locks, and what we're looking at is physical key, watered lock or tumbler, watered lock, basic padlock, cheap, uh, tumbler lock, a little bit more, pin tumbler, wafer, um, some of these are secure, some aren't, and we have different grades. Now, the general one you have at home is a grade three. It's considered throwaway. Grade two, 
is either light commercial or um, heavy duty residential. Um, maybe that thing you have in the front door but not the back and grade one a commercial. There are also cylinder categories which are low, no um, pick or drill resistance up to high where there's some pick or drill resistance. Take your time to get through. And attacks against uh, locks, tension wrench and whatever else are used to break in. It's actually not that difficult to um, uh, break into most of these locks, especially the lower types. Locks, combination, understand the difference between combination, cipher locks, etc. and any override codes that may be in place. Device locks, once again a little bit of reading, won't go into it um, due to time but there will be plenty of reading up there for you. Personal access controls, user activated, um, proximity devices, etc. Anyone who's had a look around some of the banking um, type environments will notice that um, you have something you swipe and it goes with you. Hopefully it stays. Also need to understand the difference between fencing. Fences three to four feet to deter casual trespasser, up to eight feet if you're really serious about what you're doing. And you need to memorize the gauges and mesh size. So fencing best practices if you want to um, do well in this for the exam. Critical areas should always be fenced with a fence of eight feet plus. Bollards, these are small concrete pillars. So guys who've gone round to the um, uh, buildings down in Canberra will, will remember all of these. Um, AFP building has some nice ones. They have these little ones that are um, concrete pillars that can go up and down and um, sort of go into the ground when they want to ride, uh, get cars in or whatever else in and pop back up. So uh, drop down ceilings, drop down walls, all that sort of fun stuff. Um, yeah, all that stuff that Darren's talking about, whether people can crawl through the um, drywall, the crawl space, all the stuff you see in the movies with people trying to crawl through. So we want to stop people from driving through a wall with the bollard. Um, important. At the end of the day, we don't want someone driving into our building. It has happened many times. So lighting is important. We want to have perimeter security. Um, and coverage should overlap. We want to make sure that we have lighting in place so that it can actually capture what we're doing. Surveillance, we need to make sure that we have controls in place, CCTV and all the rest. So cameras, transmitters, receivers and recording systems. We want to make sure that we have decent focal length and you need to understand the difference between fixed and variable focus length um, and we're going to define that in a second. Focal length goes, for anyone who's done any camera stuff, will be um, whether you zoom, whether you're looking at wide angle etc and all of this really comes down to what you manage to capture. So physical detection, um, intrusion detection, we're talking about not necessarily IDS in the traditional what we're talking about a network side of it but capturing entry physical IDS here how we capture what they're doing vibration plates sensor plates all that stuff and um, photoelectric passive infrared acoustic detection all these fun things we see in the movies all the time so at the end of the day also patrols and guards etc so we're trying to make it so that we can limit access we start with CP TED, we start by making an environment that makes it difficult for people to break in. We start by making it so that our people are comfortable and then we harden. That's what we're doing at the end of the day. So that's where we are with physical. There'll be a whole lot of stuff loaded tomorrow. There's lots more reading. There'll be lots more audio material and everything else. Um, Yes, I've seen those too because of the um, pay wave chip and whatever else. So, all right, that's it for week four. There's lots of stuff that I've got to um, already answer on the forum again and, and people have been up there and active. So please take it back there and let's go and talk more. Lots of fun and lots more to do. Okay, guys, I hope you enjoyed this and um, got lots more. And, okay, that's it for the day.